Hi, this is Nathan Batty with ChristianResearcher.com and we're thankful that you've joined us for another study in the book of Hebrews. This week we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 and go down through the rest of the chapter. In chapter 1, the Hebrew writer is wanting to remind the brethren that they serve a God who is active, who is present, who does speak, and not speaking by just angels and prophets anymore. He is spoken by His Son. And the message that the Son has brought, the New Testament, the New Covenant, is greater than the old one which was provided by the angels. And so as you're going through persecution and difficult times, don't think God's absent. No, He is present and He has spoken to you by His Son. So listen up to what the Son has to say. Also in chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible points out that God Himself had attested to them by signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God was demonstrating physically, not just by the message of the Son, but by actions, by miraculous power, that He was present and He was involved in the life of the church. God had special things in plan for the church in store for it. And so the Hebrew writer is reminding them of all these things to comfort them in times of persecution. That's where we pick up in chapter 2 now in verse 5. This section of scriptures can be outlined in, in three breakdowns, basically. The first section begins in chapter 2, verse 5, and goes down through verse 9, where it's talking about God's plan for all of mankind that's always been there. Then, beginning in verse 10 through verse 16, you have Jesus set forth as the champion of our faith. And then the final two verses, verse 17 and 18, speak of how Jesus, as our champion, is now qualified to become our high priest and to make intercession for us. He begins by talking in verse 5 and going down through verse 9 about Jesus sharing in our humanity. And this is very important. He quotes from Psalms, the 8th chapter. And what he's doing in this psalm is showing three things. Number one, he's showing the incarnation of Christ. Number two, the glorification of Christ. And number three, all things being put in subjection under his feet. What you're doing in that section is you're seeing what's happened in the past. Jesus being incarnated. You're seeing what's happened in the present. Jesus being glorified. He is in heaven glorified right now. And then we get to see into the future, Jesus having all things set under his feet. Not all things have been placed there yet, but one day everything will be brought into subjection and placed under Jesus' feet, and time will be no more. That's what he says beginning in verse 5. He has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. No, he's placed it under the subjection of Christ. Notice what it says, verse 6. But one testified in a certain place, saying, <clears throat> What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all, subject, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Notice what he's, he's arguing here. Jesus, for a short period of time, came and was placed lower than the angels. Don't therefore think that the angels are greater than Jesus. No, no, this was a temporary thing, and he has now been taken back to heaven and placed in glory and honor. He's also going to one day have all things put under his feet. Now notice there's a stress there put in verse 8 of all things are going to put in subjection to him. He goes on later in the verse, he says, For in that he put all in subjection under him, he has left nothing that is not put under him. He uses a double negative there to show there is absolutely nothing, nothing at all, that will not fall under the authority of Christ. He clarifies, he says, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. So you're going through persecution, these people might be asking and wondering, why is God allowing this to happen to me? Is he, does he not have authority over all things? The writer's saying, the final subjection of all things has not happened yet. But don't think that it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. It is a sure thing. How do we know this? Because God has incarnated His Son as He promised. Because God has glorified His Son by raising Him from the dead and sitting Him at His right hand. And so based on that, realized He is going to have all things subjected to Him down the road. Verse 9 now, But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. He was placed in the form of a human for a short time. This was a brief period, but has now been exalted is the point. And he goes on there, um, For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He was made lower. Why? 
so that he could be glorified one day and taken back to heaven and so that he might taste death for everyone. And that becomes an important phrase throughout the rest of this chapter, the idea that Jesus tasted death for everyone. That phrase, tasted death, is a Semitic term which implies suffering or extreme suffering. In other words, the type of death that Jesus would die was going to be one of great suffering for all men. Also notice, it says he might taste death for everyone. This is the idea of universal atonement versus universal salvation. God, Christ did not come and die in order that every man, no matter, regardless of their obedience, would be saved. No, he came and he suffered death for that everyone might be saved. Universalism is a false doctrine. Universal atonement is a true doctrine. He has paid the universal price for all of mankind, but that does not mean that all men will be saved. Verse 10 now, for it was fitting for him. In other words, what happened to Christ was in line with the will of the Father. This is how the Father had always, always planned for things to take place. God always wanted to reconcile His creation back to Him. For it was fitting for Him, for whom all things and by whom all things were made, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. God has always had a plan to reconcile all mankind unto Himself if they would be willing to be reconciled. So, he did this by appointing Jesus as the captain of salvation perf and making him perfect through suffering, by making him complete. Jesus takes on the human form, suffers in every way such as man, even more so, and he is made thus the captain of our salvation. That phrase is one that you ought to hold on to there, the captain of our salvation. Jesus is now the triumphant captain. And what he begins to paint throughout the rest of this chapter is the idea of a captain leading his army into battle. Jesus represents himself with his people. He's not ashamed of his brother. He is willing to stand up with them, to fight with them, to lead them into battle, and to champion their salvation. He says, verse 11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I in the children whom God has given me. Notice what he's doing. In the first quotation there, he's saying, I will declare your name in the midst of my brethren. In other words, I am going to stand with my brethren. And I will identify with my brethren whom God has given me. And from there, assembly. I will declare God's name to you. In other words, I'm going to go down to earth and gather my children together, those who will follow me, and I am going to declare to them the power of God and the plan of God in saving them. Not only am I going to declare that plan to them, but I will put my trust in God. In other words, I'm going to have confidence in God's plan that he will fulfill it. And thus I'm going to submit myself in all things to my Father, even the death of the cross. And he says, again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. I, through my suffering, am going to purchase the church, and I will stand by the church, the precious bought institution of Christ. He says, verse 14 now, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. The scene that you have being pictured here is the champion going forth into battle. And I can't help but remember the story of David. The children of Israel were in subjection to Philistine bondage at this time. And the, the Philistines sent out their champion, uh, Goliath. And Goliath parades around and he taunts and he tries to humiliate the children of God. And the children of God are in fear. They're in fear of dying. They're in fear of the oppression that this giant brings with him. And David steps forward as the champion of the Israelites. And he goes out and he does battle with Goliath. And he defeats Goliath. And he takes away the power of the Philistines. And the Philistines are routed. That's exactly what we're seeing here in the story that's pre presented with Jesus. Jesus is the champion of our faith. He goes out to do one-on-one -on -one battle with the devil. And though it seems that he dies at first, no, he has created the greatest victory ever. And he has wrenched, uh, wrenched away from the devil the power that he had in death. For years and years, Satan 
His power, his most powerful tool, was the power of death. Men have always feared death. Is there an afterlife? How can we know that there's an afterlife? What is it that lies beyond the grave? Jesus took that power away from him by proving he is going to resurrect from the grave, by being the first fruits of our salvation. And so now, death no longer has its sting, is what the Bible is teaching. He is championed over death and the grave. In other words, we should no longer live in fear of death. Because Christ has resurrected, one day we too shall rise to be with him in the air. What he's pointing out also is that Jesus chose to fight for his people, and he also chose to die for his people. That was necessary in order to bring salvation to the world. And here's the point I don't want you to miss. Salvation was a very costly thing. We have costly grace. So don't forfeit that. Don't recognize it as a cheap thing. Recognize it for what it is. Grace was very costly, and salvation was costly, and it was meant to bring about the unification of God's people, is what Hebrews chapter 2 is teaching. Verse 16, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Now he introduces a very important point here now. The seed of Abraham were going to be blessed through Christ. This was one of the great prophecies of the Old Testament. Israel began to think of this in terms of their physical nation. But here the writer, the Hebrew writer, applies the idea of the seed of Abraham being blessed to the church. And what he's demonstrating is now that God has a new people. He has a new Israel, a spiritual Israel. In verse, uh, verse 12, I will declare your name in the midst of my Brethren, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Verse 13, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Verse 16, he does, not give, he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. He's speaking of his children being unified together, having brethren, having an assembly, being the seed of Abraham. The idea is the church has been established. This is God's new Israel, and this is whom he has championed for over death in order to reconcile unto himself. Verse 17, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things per pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. As Jesus came down and took on human flesh, and he suffered in all ways such as we, and he was tempted in all ways such as we, he became the champion of our faith, and now as the champion, he is fully qualified to go before God as our high priest and make intercession for us. Not that he only champion once in the cross. He champions daily for us. He goes before us and leads us into battle today. And he stands before God making intercession for us. What an awesome privilege to have Christ, the high priest and champion of our faith, with us today. Now I want you to think about a couple things in closing here. As Jesus is our captain... He is not asking anything out of us that he has not himself already done. That's a mark of a great leader, one who is willing to lead by example. Jesus led by example in submitting himself in all things to his heavenly Father, even the death of the cross. And so as he is urging the Hebrew brethren to remain faithful, even in the face of death, he's not asking anything out of them that he himself has not already demonstrated through the death on the cross. Now, there's a couple questions I want to leave you with this afternoon that I want you to ponder on in light of what Hebrews chapter 2 is teaching. Number one, do you fully realize and appreciate all that Jesus has done for you in being your champion, in defeating Satan, in defeating death, in submitting himself to great suffering to become your champion and captain? Number two, will you follow Christ into battle? Wherever he leads, will you follow him, knowing that he will lead to victory, even if it means dying on his behalf? Number three, do you fully realize that Satan's power has been stripped from him and that he is defeated, that death holds no fear any longer? The reason the early church was able to have many martyrs was because even though they were threatened and even though they were beaten, they recognized who Jesus the champion was. And they were not afraid of death. There was nothing that men could take from them. They had total assurance and confidence in God through Christ the champion. Do we have that same reassurance today? Or do we doubt our Heavenly Father? Do we doubt our champion? Never doubt Christ the champion of the church. And number four, 
Have you ever felt alone in your struggles as you try to live the Christian life? Look back and reflect upon Christ our champion. You're not alone. He is there standing with you. He's fought for you in the past and He will fight for you today. He makes intercession before God. But this requires that you follow His lead into battle. You're going to have to stand for truth. You're going to have to stand for righteousness and follow wherever the champion leads. We hope that you'll consider these things. We thank you for tuning in today for this study of Hebrews chapter 2. Next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up in Hebrews chapter 3 and we'll continue our studies. If you've missed any of our previous videos, go back to our YouTube page and follow up with us. Thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful day.